There seems to be quite a lot of confusion recently online about whether ethanol ton, so the new E10 fuel, uh, what's new to us at least in the UK here, is safe to use on old plastics. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've noticed, possibly because I've been using social media more over the last year, um, but I've noticed a trend of old plastics on fire and people posting pictures of classic cars basically in flames. And that's kind of a worrying trend and a worrying thing to see. It's not nice to see at all. Um, and I don't know if that's actually related in any way to the ethanol petrols, which have say, been, in America have been around for, around for a while now. Um, so I thought I'd look into it. Now, I'm assuming all these fires aren't down to people putting fuel filters in the engine bay, which don't do it. Just don't, it's dangerous, okay? If your fuel filter is in the engine bay, Take it out, put it under the fuel tank or somewhere, okay? Just, just move it. Um, however, it could be. So I thought I'd look into it. Um, and it was a recent discussion on Facebook I saw where somebody was basically saying, ah, it's all, it's all hype, everything's fine, your car's safe. I use it on my Echo 25 um, and it runs absolutely fine, no issues at all. So I thought I'd look into it. I'd actually look at the facts. Is it something we have to worry about or not? This is what I found. So the official line is, if your car was manufactured after 2011, it's okay. That's good, isn't it? Which is none of my cars, not even my new one, which is 2005. <laughs> um, so obviously it's gonna affect a lot, a lot of people. So there's two major issues that are gonna become apparent as the, the amount of ethanol is increased in fuel, which is currently E10, um, and it's likely to go to 15 and 20 because that's already been planned for America now. Um, but what are the major issues? Well, basically there's two, two issues with ethanol in fuel. Um, the first one is that it's hygroscopic. It loves water, so it will combine with water very, very easily, and it causes something called separation within your fuel. Um, and the second issue is it's corrosive. It damages rubber, metals, plastics. It damages all sorts. It's, uh, it's quite aggressive and, and a nasty chemical. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about the first one first. So what's the issue with ethanol like in water? Well, basically, um, I know people here in the UK who only drive their cars for half a year through the, the summer months. Um, and then they're dry stored in the garages over the winter periods. I mean, I, I dry store mine for probably about three months out of the year when it's salty. Um, so I'm hoping I'm not going to be affected quite so much by this. But there are people who leave it for a lot longer um, and they leave the fuel tank fuel in the tank. So what happens in a, a place like the UK where it's cold and it gets a little bit warmer and it's cold again, it's a little bit warmer and you get a buildup of condensation within your tank. Um, and what happens is I think you need it's just 0.05% of water within the ethanol in your fuel and it starts to do something called separation. And what in the worst case scenario you can have is a layer of effectively water in the bottom of your tank and the stale fuel above it. And you come springtime or come when you start, try and start your engine, it's going to take a big old gulp of the watery stuff at the bottom. And that can't be good for any engine. Or best case scenario, you've got basically stale fuel with low octane. And again, your engine's likely not to be too happy about starting up on that. Um, the other issue, of course, is if you've got water separation within your tank, you've got water in your tank. And if it's metal, um, that's not good because obviously you're going to get corrosion within in the inside of your tank. So then you might want to start considering putting one of the products that you swill around and it actually lines the inside of your tank just to protect it. Um, or I guess you could go for a plastic fuel tank. But who wants a plastic fuel tank? Yeah, but the, the issues you may want to consider. And I'm, I'm probably talking worst case scenarios, but these are the issues we've got to consider. Now, I did hear about one little trick on how to remove any water in your fuel that's separated. So apparently there's an additive you can put in which they use in really cold climates where, where condensation is a real problem um, and it removes any water within the fuel. Um, and Method of Spirits does pretty much the same job by the sounds of it. So what it basically said was you can add up to half a litre of Method of Spirits to a full tank um, and it will actually remove any water content that's separated within your fuel. Now don't do this on my say so. I've never done it before. I've never been heard of it until last week. <laughs> so please don't do it on my say so. Um, but I am kind of curious. I mean, I wouldn't consider it for the Subaru powered one with the fuel injection and everything else, but I might consider it on the bit more basic air cooled engines I've got and stuff. Um, but I think what we'll do at the end of the video, I'll do a little experiment. I'll get a test tube um, and we'll see if we can get water separated within it and we'll see if we can reabsorb it with a bit of mess. But we'll do that at the end. So it's the second issue which concerns me the most because that's the one that's most likely to set your car on fire if you have a leak. 
um, and that's the corrosive nature of, of ethanol and obviously the more ethanol within the fuel the more corrosive it becomes. Now within the fuel pipes um, the issue is that basically rubber is, is permeable, it's got holes through it. Um, you probably notice if you ever went to the drag strip and it's raining and have a look at the, the tyres on some of the drag cars, you can actually see little bubbles of water, uh, little bubbles of air and uh, coming out of tyres. So the vapour gets through rubber um, and what happens is ethanol vapour gets through it basically and it strips out all the, the compounds within the rubber which makes it flexible. Um, so worst case scenario is your rubber goes rock hard which you might have seen over the last few years. Um, and worst case scenario is those little little tiny little holes uh, where the vapour gets through become bigger holes and eventually cracks and then you have a fuel leak uh, and obviously that's everyone's worst case scenario. So fuel hose, um, my first recommendation is if you have any black cotton braided hose of any kind on your, on your old classic, you know the old stuff they used to sell everywhere, it's all you could buy, take it off. It's dangerous, it's, it's terrible stuff. I mean, I had some in the garage dry stored for a few years um, and I put water through it and it just squirted out absolutely everywhere because it did, just had perished basically within the garage dry. Um, so, and if you can't see the hose underneath it, see what condition it's in, then you don't know you're gonna have an issue. So my opinion is if you have the old fashioned stuff is remove it. They may well do a, a modern, higher quality grade braided cotton hose, I have no idea. But if it's the old stuff, I wouldn't even entertain it, just, just remove it, it's, in my opinion, it's just dangerous. So the two types of fuel hose we need to talk about really are R6 and R9. So uh, I actually bought some fuel hose about a fortnight ago from uh, Motor Factors and it was R6 and that's despite the fact that E10 fuel's coming in. So you have to be careful um, when you're buying fuel hose now um, that you are getting the, the right one. So R6 was a standard, it's been a standard for quite a few years now and chances are if you replaced it um, over the last few years you got R6 fuel hose on it. R6 is not designed for ethanol and it will deteriorate and it will eventually fail. Um, R9, so when you buy it basically you need to make sure you've got a little symbol on there look, if you can see it. So you need to make sure you've got R9 fuel hose which is designed for ethanol. So basically it's designed with three layers. You have an internal layer which is a synthetic rubber which is not more, it's 0.003% the permeability of R6 I believe so it's a lot less permeable it'll let, it'll let, it'll let a lot less ethanol through um, through the, the rubber than the R6 will. So it has a, a synthetic rubber ethanol resistant core um, it's reinforced, it's good for 100 psi, so it's good for fuel injection cars and then it should have an outer layer which is oil and heat resistant and stuff. So basically R9 is the, is the basic standard now you need to be looking at for fuel hose and if you've got anything less than that my personal recommendation is take the time uh, and swap it out and put some R9 on as, as a minimum. Um, I have seen reports online of R9 failing um, and one particular one said it failed in less than a year <laughs> with ethanol 10 fuel. Now I don't know if that's down to a, a misbranding issue or poor manufacturing issues or it wasn't made to standard. I don't know, it seems a bit strange that it would fail so quickly I'll be honest um, and I kind of suspect we don't know the whole picture on, on that particular story. Um, but obviously once you've fitted this you want to you keep an eye anyway just to make sure um, and obviously keep an eye on your fuel filter. Um, apparently it can start to deteriorate the inner core um, and that goes through to your filter and stuff. So just, just be wary uh, and keep an eye out, eye out if you're using R9, but R9 should be your minimum standard, in my opinion, if you're using ethanol 10 fuel. I personally have been using this one for uh, the last five years or so. Um, again, I believed when I bought it, it was um, an R9 equivalent fuel hose. Um, and it stood up on with the ethanol 5 fuel hose uh, fuels quite well. However, I can feel it starting to harden. So I suspect it's not actually R9 equivalent at all because um, this used to be quite flexible and now it's not so much. This is a piece that was actually uh, had fuel going through it for a while. Um, so I actually said this in a previous video, I'm replacing mine this, this winter. That should have been last winter. I'm going to do it this winter. My plan, however, is that. Now this is Teflon or uh, PTFE um, hose. Um, it's stainless steel braided so hopefully it's not going to be damaged and wear through and in theory in theory it should be ethanol resistant or totally ethanol resistant so uh, again I've heard people saying it does attack even um, Teflon um, but I'm hoping this is going to be my long-term safe hose to go for the disadvantage of using this sort of stuff is it's inexpensive 
Um, this is about nine pounds a meter at the minute. I think if you buy it in uh, a sensible amount of bulk, um, and it's also a bit more tricky to work with. It can be clamped down, but you have to kind of clamp it down in two stages with the outer sheath and then the inner sheath if it, if it's braided. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit more tricky to work with, or you can actually get the proper connectors, um, and it's very expensive. So R9, make R9 your standard, your bare minimum. Um, and if you want to get a fancy, you could always look at alternatives. Uh, which is where I'm going with my um, fuel injection Subaru motored car. I'll probably stick to R9 possibly and as much metal lines as I can um, with the, the classic Beetles. Cause... So you've replaced all your fuel hoses with R9 and now you're safe to go driving with E10 fuel all day long and it'll be no problem at all. No. It's not that easy unfortunately. So basically most of us classics have got carburetors and fuel pumps and they've all got rubber diaphragms and uh, rubber seals and gaskets in there um, you may have aluminium or zinc alloy parts which are corroded by ethanol um, even cork gaskets can deteriorate with ethanol um, and as far as I can see I might, I might be talking worst case scenario but it's just gonna be a minefield of potential mechanical failures or leaks or issues that you're gonna have to sort out um, which could be avoided by sticking to the, the lower grade E5 but higher octane fuels. So for, for beef, the Subaru powered one, I have to use the high octane 98 RON E5 fuel anyway because uh, it stops pre-detonation in the engine, it's 98 RON minimum. Um, but certainly when I get the air cooled and the classic stuff on the road, um, which hopefully will be next year, I'll be sticking to the, uh, to the E5 uh, 98 stuff. I mean, I think it's personally, I know it's more expensive to do it, but for the limited amount of mileage that I drive my cars, um, I think it's it's a small price to pay, a small, small increased price to pay for maintaining reliability of parts and not having parts fail, um, the, and the cost and the hassle and the, the, the nightmare of, uh, of all those potential breakdowns and, and stuff. So for me, it might be, it might be safe to use E10, I can't tell you it is or not. I can give you the facts that I've learned. Um, but personally, I'm sticking to the E5 for as long as possible. So I hope that helps, guys. Take care. Okay, experiment time. So what we've got here, um, it's actually petrol. It's a funny colour because it's got a bit of oil contamination, but it's just basically uh, 95 petrol. Um, some standard meth, so methylated spirits, and some tap water. So we're going to get the petrol. And... I have tried this and I've spilt it once and my pot's starting to melt, so <laughs> you have to be quick. So in here we've just got petrol, funny coloured petrol, and I'm going to put a couple of mustard spoons of water in there. Put the tap on, give it a shake, and I hope the water and the fuel won't mix. I have to say, actually, but it is there, look. Oh, it's better to see this angle. So there we go, look at the bottom. So there's the water separated in the bottom of the oil. So it's white at the bottom. So what we're going to do... Take our meths. I'm going to put a couple of teaspoons of meths in here. Top back on. Give it a shake. And wait. Now the first time I did this, I didn't expect this at all. What I expected to happen was the auto basically mix in again, and it doesn't do that. So what basically happens is you have a separation of the fuel and the meths, and then the meths is combined with the water. So you can't see any separate water in there anymore. You can just see fuel and meths effectively, or meths and water mix. And I guess the theory is that the meths and water mix will go through your engine and burn and uh, everything's hunky dory and runs happily, or as happily as it can do when it's running on meths and water. Mm. In hindsight, I don't think I want to try this on my car.
<laughs> but I wanted to do the experiment, see what happened. And it's always nice when experiments don't go exactly as you think they are going to do. Alright, I better get rid of this now because I think my bottle's starting to melt. Cheers, guys. Take care.